Well, good morning. It's uh, good to be here. My name is Alex Ruthman, and I'm helping facilitate the Play With Your Music course. And today we're excited to have Clara Berry and Wool Dog here. Hello. 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 Hi. And that Clara Berry and Wool Dog are Clara Berry and Joe O'Neill. Hi again. Hi. Hello. <laughs> and we're also fortunate to have Bradford Swanson here. Hi. Brad is the producer and engineer on their uh, on their latest album, and we're here today as part of the Play With Your Music course to get to know Clara and Joe and Brad's uh, perspective on the song Air Traffic and get to know a little bit more about how it was made, how it was put together, their process uh, both creatively and technically uh, going from the very beginnings of the songwriting process through touring the the song and then eventually going into the studio and producing and recording the song. So uh, I guess a good place to start would be with you, Claire. Uh, could you talk a little bit about Air Traffic? Um, what is it about? What was your inspiration for the song? Um, it's kind of just one of those songs that started, I just started um, banging out a harmony and then the melody came and then I just had like the line, Air Traffic Control, I'm coming down, in my head. So then, um, then it became about a metaphorical plane crash, but um, it wasn't like I didn't set out to write a song about a plane crash. It just sort of that lyric started in my head, and then I developed on it into the full um, song. So, so for you, the the lyric and the music came together, or was or or is that the case? Yes, that that first like um, bit of the melody with that lyric line sort of started together, and um, so that sort of gave me my where I, my starting place for writing the song. Okay, and how long ago? Uh, when when did that inspiration happen? I mean, now today it's it's 2013, the end of 2013. How long ago uh, did you have that inspiration? Um, I think it was actually uh, 2000, 2010, or. Okay. 2009, I can't remember. It was one of those summers. It was in the summertime. I remember that. Okay. So could you tell us a little bit then about your process of how you went from that, um, that, that, that idea with just that air traffic control uh, motive and, 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 and line? How did, how, did you, how did it develop from there? Um, just kind of hammering away at uh, different harmonies and then just building a, a melody that I, I liked and working the lyrics into... Um, I guess I, I feel like the melody and the lyrics kind of came along at the same time because it's kind of hard to go back and write, for me anyway, it's hard for me to go back and write lyrics to a melody that I've created that makes sense and flow nicely. So they sort of um, developed at the same time. Uh, and I, I, I don't think it took very long. It was like, I think the song was done in a matter of like a few hours, just kind of intense hours of just banging away. Okay. And you, it's interesting here, when you're, when you're saying banging away, um, I assume you're meaning at the piano. So could, could you talk a little bit about that process? Uh, 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 do you write with the piano? Do you write away from the piano? What is the role that your main instrument there has with uh, your songwriting process? I, I'll, I'll start songs usually at the piano and just sort of hammering out different chords and sort of figuring out what I want to do for a harmony and um, and then once I kind of know what I'm going to be doing um, in that regard I'll I'll sort of have the melody in my head and I'll be at work or wherever and I'll be singing it and like tweaking the lyrics constantly um, so the banging part happens at the piano and then it's like tweaking which can kind of happen anywhere or at least for the, the melody and the lyrics mm -hmm. And when you're when you're writing a song, or, or I guess more specifically here with air traffic, are you are you writing that all the way through from very beginning to end, or how how does the how does musical structure uh, and the structure of the song with verses and choruses and things how does that develop for you, or or how did that develop in this song? Um, I don't know that I remember exactly how it developed in this song, but generally, um, I might like write two different like kind of like chunks like. Um, uh, what's going to be a verse and be like, oh, I really like this, and then like might separately write what will end up being a chorus and being like, I really like this, and then just sort of stringing the two together. Um, or sometimes they do just just happen start to finish, 
like just working it through. That's like that's if it's something that I write in a very short amount of time. Usually it'll be just like right start to finish. But if it takes a longer time, it just can happen in pieces that get strung together. Mm -hmm. Do you record yourself when you're working this out, or is it all just stored in your head? Do you write any of it down? Uh, how do you how do you then you know fix it and then start to work with it from there? Um, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, if I get a melody in my head and I'm not anywhere near a computer, I'll, I'll take my phone out and I'll record just the melody. And then um, when I'm working on a song, I'll record the different parts um, because I, while I'm still trying to learn it and figure it out so that I don't forget what I want to do. And um, so I'll usually record like a piano part and then like layer something and just sort of figure out how I want it to sound and maybe try and incorporate that um, the different layers into what I'm playing on the piano and what I'm singing. Mm -hmm. So in, in, you, you mentioned there recording the piano part and then layering is that where you'll you'll record the piano part and then play it back and then sing on top of that or yeah. are you actually like layering it, layering it in a like a soft piece of software? Um, I'll mostly just like I'll I might layer like what I would do in like different hands and what I'm gonna sing so that I can then have something to, um, a kind of like a goal of what I want it to end up sounding like in a live performance. Great. So um, that's a good segue into into live performance. Do you do you remember the first time that you performed Air Traffic? I do actually. Um, I, we, I, it was like an outdoor concert in my hometown and. Um, my friend Mike actually played slide guitar on um, on the song, which actually I think gave some momentum towards where the song ended up in the end as sort of a um, with a spaghetti western feel, which was ultimately Brad's, like how Brad perceived it, and we took it from there. Great. So, um, you know, you, you start off as a very personal process with you as the singer, songwriter, and piano player. How did you decide to add the slide guitar onto that, and and how did you convey your song to the slide guitar player? Was was he the only musician? Uh, did you have notation? Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, we were just, I mean, we were just like in uh, in his basement, and he just was playing guitar, and then he just saw the slide and was like, oh, I'm I'm gonna do this now, and then it's, we we're like, oh, that sounds awesome, like, and uh, that's that's how that ended up. Yeah, I, I often find that the case that there's, you know, you're playing along and you're kind of improvising, and then an idea comes together that sparks and is interesting, and then that kind of sticks through. Was that the case in this process? Yes, definitely. And yeah. um, so, and then I went on to keep playing that song solo, but I kind of had that slide guitar part in my head, um, mm -hmm. and I think that definitely influenced where the song ended up. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I, I noticed through looking on, on your YouTube channel that you had released uh, a version of this song uh, before the EP at least a, a year or two ago. Uh, could you talk about that process, about you know, why did you release it, how did you record it, the whole uh, process around that? Um, I think I just did that whole video on the, um, just with my, my laptop, just recording it with the, the built-in mic, just because I was trying to get in the habit of recording and recording videos and posting videos on a regular basis. So I was just doing some live um, videos and um, and it was just, yeah, it was just a MacBook with a MacBook speaker. Mm -hmm. So wh why, why as a singer, songwriter, performer, do you, do you find it important to create those videos and put them out there? What is, what's the role and the, and the benefit for you? Um, I think it just, it's, I mean, now it's important to have content on a regular basis. I think videos are a good, um, are the best source of content for like your Facebook or whatever posting. That's just people are more interested in seeing a video um, than any almost anything else, except maybe pictures. But when you're a musician, there's not there's only so many pictures you can post. Right. Uh, Why well, I, I do want to kind of come back to the you know, the video and, and, and how you're distributing, but uh, to, to keep the focus a bit on the, on the musical side, uh, what was the process that, you know, I know you'd been going around and playing the song in various venues and it's part of your touring repertory. Um, how did you decide to uh, make 
you know, bring it into the Magician's Wife album. Uh, and uh, when did you decide to uh, start con considering working with a producer and engineer for that? Um, we talked to Brad in 2011, I think. Um, Brad approached us about doing the recording, and Air Traffic was the first on the on the docket to be recorded because um, I had several people approach me about like, oh, I really want a recording of that song, and I didn't have one, so um, that was definitely our top priority to get that song recorded. Um, and so, yeah, I think in 2000, early 2012 is when we started on it. Great. And so, uh, how did you go about finding Brad or, or even starting that process? Um, I think Alan Williams hooked us up. Is that is that right, Brad? Yeah, that's right. I had asked. I was looking for people to record, and I touched base with Alan, and he was like, "You got to talk to Claire." And that was that was, I think, summer of 2011. And then our first, like, we did a lot of pre-production in the fall of 2011. And then 2012, we did that big session in January, and I think that's where we got the majority of the stuff. Okay. Well, okay. You, you mentioned Alan Williams, and, and that's Alan Williams, the professor of music business and musician in, in the greater Boston area. Um, and you talked, Brad, also about, um, you mentioned the word pre-production. Could you talk a little bit about that process and what you mean by that? Um, pre-production is kind of, I, I think it's one of the most important stages in the recording process of... Um, there's there's kind of a social aspect to it of like everybody getting to know each other and uh, learning how each other works, and then there's also the very musical aspect of like going through every song and pulling it apart and figuring out what direction we want to go with it. Uh, we talked a lot about you know uh, what influences might have might go into it, what we might want it to sound like recorded who might be available to play on it, um, and what direction it could go from from there. And then that's all good information to bring into the studio, because uh, if you don't figure those things out in advance, then you're sort of spending a lot of time in the studio spinning your wheels trying to figure out what you want to do. So so is that something you do, like, in the living room or at the coffee house? Or, or walk us just through that what that process looks like, uh, and, and, and specifically... Uh, what were some of the discussions that you had uh, around the pre-production of air traffic? Um, I think for us it sort of began like Claire and I met once during the summer, which I think was probably the first time I had ever met Claire. And, um, and then we decided, and this was sort of a conceptual idea, we decided to record every song that Claire was thinking about for the record just in one session, you know, setting up in a studio with all the musicians in one room um, and just record them to try and get an idea of, so, so I could hear the songs and uh, learn what they sounded like and also have recordings to refer back to throughout the process. Um, and th there was also sort of the idea that if during the production process I started meddling too much and screwing up the original concept of the song, we'd always have these recordings of what it sounded like in their original like okay. form. Um, and we actually came back to some of those recordings for the record. I, th I think three or four songs, uh, their sort of basic tracks come from that first session. So. Okay. So you, you first would kind of just, you know, record them through at kind of as they as they would have been performed acoustically and then uh, use those as references through the process then of working. Yeah, and then there was collaboration where we'd all sort of get together, either, you know, just Claire and I or Claire, Joe and I or Claire, Joe, Elizabeth and I and um, we'd either set up a small recording session and try some things or uh, there were a lot of times where we just met, you know, somewhere, you know, a coffee shop or a living room or something just to talk through things. Mm -hmm. um, and then that that sort of evolves, like, uh, pre-production, I think, doesn't stop when the production starts. 
it's something that keeps going. Like I know we had a lot of time after all the basic tracks were done just when we were thinking about overdubs and uh, the percussion sessions and background vocals and stuff where we'd just sit in the living room and try different ideas and um, that I think has a pre-production aspect to it too. You know, before you really commit to it, you try out some ideas and sometimes Sometimes the ideas you're just trying out end up being the ideas on the record, too. Great. Claire, can you talk a little bit about, um, about the pre-production process for you? What, what was, um, yeah, just tell us a little bit about that. Um, I, it was really useful to us because when you're playing songs, because we, we didn't done a whole lot of home recordings with a lot of these tunes, so when you're playing songs live a lot of the time, um, how you perceive them from a live perspective and how when you hear them recorded back at you, um, it gives you a totally different perspective on the song and like what it can be in a recording. Because what it can be in a recording, you kind of have to think in a different bubble from what it can be in a live performance. So it's really good to, to do that, like what we did with recording all the songs through and then sort of tossing around some ideas and seeing, oh, like this, this could go here in the recording. Um, was really important for like kind of opening your our minds to like what was possible um, with each song. Great. Was there was there anything that uh, that you remember specifically around air traffic that uh, your conception of the song changed um, within during the pre-production process? Um. Yeah. Definitely. The. Um, I think our conception of of boys on the record. Um, because Brad heard horns, and I think at first we were like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, because horns is not something we've ever thought of as, like, playing with our music, and we were like, well, I don't know if horns are going to work, and then we then we did it, and we were, we were like, this is awesome, like, you know, it's just totally changed our concept of what um, that song could be, and actually kind of the same with air traffic, because, um, so Joe added that sort of driving, like, horse horse galloping beat to it and so I think from that Brad heard like the spaghetti western style and then Brad's like oh I'm hearing like spaghetti western like baritone guitar pedal steel type things and I was like oh, I'm not sure if that's totally direction of the song but then we like started trying some stuff out and it really that's and it's like oh okay like that that is where the song is supposed to go great uh, Joe, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your decision or the impulse or what, what made you play around with that life force uh, drum beat on the tom? Um, I think the first time we played it together, um, we were trying to come up with something in uh, just a regular backbeat just didn't sound right. And we had already done that in another tune, so looking for something original. And... Um, with the kind of repetitive keyboard thing, it just seemed to make sense to do something uh, kind of driving and repetitive. Great. And it just seemed to sound right. Do you have any other, uh, as you know, you, you regularly tour and play with Clara, but you weren't the songwriter. Um, do you have anything uh, that you notice about the song from when you first heard it to the point of when you entered pre-production and recording that, uh, um, that, that might be interesting to share with uh, the viewers? Yeah, so you mean um, from when we first played it to when we uh, were laying down those demos with Brad? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, to begin with, I had I had rehearsed it with Claire without Elizabeth, so there was no uh, bass to kind of work off of. And then and then we I mean then we played it with Elizabeth, and um, I fooled around with some different ideas. Um, originally, the song was just that driving rhythm throughout the whole thing, and then we fooled around putting a slight backbeat um, towards the middle as it builds. And by the time we were doing pre-production with Brad, um, those ideas had kind of been solidified. And uh, even during that time, though, it changed uh, once more before it was actually recorded. Okay. So at the you know you've gone through this pre-production process, you've recorded them through, you've discussed the structure of the song, the instruments that are going to play, the overall feeling, uh, and you kind of settled on that spaghetti western thing. Um, 
could you tell us a bit about the process then next of moving into the studio? I and mean, what is that experience like? I mean, uh, how did you manage that? How did you actually go through um, the process of recording air traffic? And maybe we could start with Brad and then go to Claire and Joe. Yeah. Can I get the question one more time? I'm sorry. Sure. No. Uh, it, just just talking about the process. Okay, you've gone through pre-production and you've set the structure and the style and the feeling, and you have an idea of where it's going to be going for the final recording. Uh, Tell us a little bit about the process then once you've booked the studio time and you're now in the, in the studio. Uh, how does the process of air traffic develop now that you're in the studio? Um, so uh, I think it's, it's unique for every recording and for every group, but for this particular recording, um, there was that initial recording we did, which was fall 2011. Um, and that was just Claire and Joe playing, but that sort of began the concept and we started thinking about things. That, from there, I don't think the arrangement changed too much. You guys had already kind of pared it down to a nice, like, tight little package. And then in January, it was Clara, Joe, and Elizabeth, who plays bass on that tune, um, just playing in one room. Uh, we probably recorded, like, eight or nine different versions, which might have slight variations in tempo, stuff like that. Like, I think we tried it a little bit slower and a little bit faster and then settled on the eventual tempo. Um, and there are also times in there where just everybody's trying to get a performance they feel really good about. Um, so, you know, you might get three or four performances that are passable, they sound pretty good, but then I, I think especially with this tune, there was one that just felt great. Um, and from that initial session, I think all we... I'm not sure we actually used any tracks that you hear on the recording, but that became the framework for what we built the whole recording on. So um, from there... I think we did some piano overdubs, um, which I don't think it was because the performance was off. I think it was actually a technical issue we had, so we had to have Clara re-record that piano part. Um, and then Joe came in and re-recorded the drum part, and we, I think we ended up going with a slightly different drum part than the original one that had been recorded. Then Elizabeth came in and played her bass parts over again, and uh, I think it was just Elizabeth and I at that session, um, so we had time to really focus on her parts and say, you know, do we want to use that note there or, you know, try a different one? Um, and then I had reached out to Liz Lawrence, who plays baritone and pedal steel on this, um, because I, I was so, so, so into the idea of a baritone guitar on this, and uh, so I reached out to her just to see if she had a baritone guitar and she could play the part. Um, and she said, yeah, I'd be happy to. So I met with her and talked to her a little bit about it and uh, gave her a copy of the song as it, in the state it was then. And then, it, actually, I think the credit goes to her. She, she said, you know, I'm really hearing pedal steel on this. Do you want to try some stuff? So she brought her pedal steel along, which is no minor feat because that's a giant piece of hardware, and uh, added all that pedal steel stuff, which I think kind of makes the song, you know, stands above and beyond what it is just as a really great song in its own right. I think the pedal steel adds so much. Great. Uh, Claire and Joe, can you talk a little bit then about that, that same process uh, process and experience for you? Um, yeah, I, I kind of echoing what Brad was saying. I, the framework of the song by the time we were recording was definitely pretty well set. But um, then for us, I think we went in and we did our parts as we had been doing them. And so sort of our perspective didn't really change that much until we heard um, Liz Lawrence's parts, which that just sort of blew us away because it's like, wow, this really takes the concept of this tune to like a totally different place. Um, I think a good like meter, because 
we were really close to the recording, but like my like showing the recording with the first recording with Liz to um, my parents who had heard it the song like a number of times and seeing their reaction is sort of just like there because they weren't part of the recording process at all. And so seeing their co concept of the song totally change was sort of interesting to me. Um, but, yeah, I'd say that our, just our perception changed when we heard the, the, the pedal steel and the baritone guitar yeah. parts. So, so to kind of just, just recap then, um, the process was you, you went into the studio and then you would have been uh, all in the same room playing the song with multiple microphones set up. Um, and you get a performance, you run through it a few times, faster, slower, you come together with a performance you like, and then that, um, if I'm right, Brad, served as a template, and then you brought in the musicians individually to overdub or re-record those parts, um, focusing on getting a, a better performance, and then that stitched together um, into the into into a, a final piece, because it's, it's interesting that you you go through this process um, of playing together and the song is already so fully developed and then you get the idea to bring in another musician for whom the Clara you hadn't even heard uh, play on that tune and then you get your song all of a sudden with this new musician layer added and it changes things and, and shifts and morphs. Is that is that a fair summary? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a really good summary. Um, and the I don't think that was any of our intentions necessarily setting out, but um, it's sometimes songs kind of naturally evolve during the recording process where, you know, you just get a, a really great musician um, who resonates with the song and they, they bring something totally fresh to it and then that inspires everybody else in the process and mm -hmm. take it to a new direction, you know. Well, while we're while we're here still in the in the production in the studio process, um, both Brad and, and Claire, maybe we'll start first with Brad. Could you talk about how you set up the the room and describe the room a little bit, and uh, how did you choose and, and uh, set up the microphones for capturing the sounds of these instruments? Took me a minute to find the unmute. Um, so. In this case, the most important thing uh, for us was that Clara, Joe, and Liz could see each other and sort of communicate in that way because that's so important, like having that visual connection. So we didn't want them to be isolated too much. Um, but when you're recording, uh, especially acoustic instruments like a piano, you do need a certain amount of isolation so that the microphones in the piano aren't just overwhelmed by drums. Uh, um, and you don't, we don't want to ask Joe to play quietly because that's going to affect sort of the timbre of his performance. Uh, we want him to play with the intensity of, you know, a really, in, in some of those places we want him to play very loudly. Um, so we needed to separate those things. So. Um, I'm not sure I can get a picture up right away, but uh, basically the way we set it up was there, there was an isolation room in the studio with a nice big window. So Joe went into that isolation room with the drums so he could play drums as loud as he wanted. And then Liz and Claire were set up just outside that window in a larger room um, where they could see Joe and they also had microphones so they could talk to Joe through headphones. Um, and then, but his drum sound wouldn't get into the piano microphones, which was the biggest deal. Um, and then uh, there, there was sort of a variety of microphones in the piano uh, that we were trying out some different things, but it, it basically settled on five different microphones, sort of in two different microphone techniques. Um, one is three omnis that are sort of very close to the strings, uh, spread out sort of a low, middle, and high register. And the other were um, just two cardioids sort of in a 
kind of a near coincident pair uh, that were just outside the piano, which is kind of like a classical recording technique. Um, and then Clara just had a vocal mic. Uh, Elizabeth played direct through a direct box. Um, and then Joe's drums were mic'd pretty conventionally. We tried a couple different things, um, but didn't obsess about it too much. Uh, it was more about just getting a really good performance. Um, and I, that, that was definitely the priority the whole time. Great. Claire and Joke, um, had you been in the recording studio like that before? This, we this, had. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that, actually, that specific one, just mm -hmm. not all, well, I had. I don't, you, had you been in the studio before? I've been inside. I'd never played in it before. But we hadn't been spent a whole lot of time in it, so it's still kind of a unique experience um, when Joe's behind the glass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so could you talk a little bit about your experiences as musicians, you know, behind the glass uh, and in there performing and, and going through it? Um, how, is, how is that experience in a recording studio different, say, than when you're uh, out playing a gig live? Well, I think when you're, like, playing a gig live, it's a very, I mean... It's a very familiar situation if you've done it a number of times. It doesn't feel a whole lot different from like just hanging out and playing. But then when you're in the studio, there's kind of like like someone's behind the glass and everyone's got headphones on and you're sort of like, oh, now I'm like, you're hyper-conscious of what you're doing, which can kind of, um, it can, I mean, I think that kind of wears off a little bit as you go and as it gets to being... 1, 2, 3 a.m. in the morning, it can be, you don't feel that way anymore, but um, when when you are first starting out, I feel like the, the glass and the headphones make, just sort of, you're aware of it, and it's like, just getting adjusted takes a little time. Great. So, um, now we've gone, you know, through the process, and you've been in the studio, um, could you talk a little bit about the process? Okay, you, you've recorded the tracks, now... What was the uh, what was the mixing and, and, and mastering process like? Um, and uh, I guess that's more of a, a technical question for Brad, unless Clara and Joe, you were part of that. But then uh, I'll follow up after that, then with asking you, uh, Clara and Joe, about you know hearing the piece and and, and at, for, for the first time, kind of in the final package state. So let's first start with Brad talking about okay, now you've got the tracks in. Where does it go from there before we hear the version that gets submitted to iTunes? So there, there are a lot of iterations. Kind of every time we would do an overdub, um, uh, I'd send a mix up to Claire and Joe for them to check out and give feedback on the overdubs. And um, there's a legion of bad ideas that I had that Claire and Joe had to sit through. So uh, uh, there were other background vocal parts. There was an acoustic guitar part. There was some sure, and uh, I think Joe and I tried doing some other tremolo guitar stuff at one point. Um, so there were all these iterations of mixes that kept going back and forth. Um, and then uh, when we finally decided on the arrangement, like these are all the instruments we want. This is everything we want where. And I started to sit down to mix it sort of properly. Um, I actually struggled for a long time. I probably did six or seven mixes that never felt better than the first rough mix that I had sent Claire and Joe. Um, and we, we were all sort of struggling with that because I, you know, that first rough mix was just very casual, sort of push up the faders on the console and put a lot of reverb on it and go. <laughs> and then we were always trying to get back to that. Um, so we did six or seven mixes. We'd send them back and forth. Claire and Joe would give me really good notes. I'd go back in, try and fix it. And then once we hit that sort of stumbling point, uh, I decided to scrap all the work on the mix that I'd done and start over sort of aiming to get back to that place. And then that got us a little bit closer, and then we sort of continually refined it. I think probably mixed that. 24 or 25 times, different iterations that went back and forth to Claire and Joe, and uh, they would send back great little notes, you know, and it can be something as large as I need more piano through the whole thing, 
or as small as like, you know, there's one little note in here that seems to be sticking out, something like that. Um, and also involved with that process was a lot of peer review, you know, reaching out to friends and uh, other engineers and sending them copies of the mix and saying, hey, we think this is going to be the first single on the record. I really want this mix to be dialed in. Um, what are your thoughts? And that's a great perspective because, uh, you know, for certainly for me and for Claire and Joe and everybody involved, um, you hear the song so much that you can start to obsess over little things and lose a sense of the holistic piece and mix and stuff like that. So uh, sending it, I know uh, I sent the mixes back to Alan Williams two or three times, and he would always send me great feedback, and uh, Alex Case listened to them a few times. Uh, some friends in L.A. from way back, they would listen to them, and... Uh, they'd all send in notes and try and synthesize those together and eventually get to the mix that you hear on iTunes. The mastering process happens uh, for the whole record. So once we've mixed every song, we're confident in all the mixes, we've signed off on them, and we're really ready to go. Uh, then it goes to the mastering house, which was MWorks. Uh, Jonathan Weiner was the mastering engineer. And uh, that's basically him sitting down for a day. Um, and I, I went along just to sort of give notes as it goes. And he is kind of the last person to listen to everything and give you that holistic view on the whole record and say, let's make all these pieces fit together as a whole. And then if he hears something where, um, you know, I might have slipped up on a mix thing. Um, he can make some notes and say, you know, it's his job. He listens to records all day, every day, helping people make these masters. So he has a really good sense of, I think there's a bit too much vocal or the bass is a little out of control here. And there are tweaks he can make with his technology that can fix those things. Or he can say, I think you should go do another mix on this. Um, and it's commonplace when you're going into a mastering session like that to bring like a dozen mixes of every tune. So there will be the mix you think is the final mix, and then you'll do a mix with the vocals up and a mix with the vocals down and a mix with the bass up and a mix with the bass down. So during that mastering session, uh, he can just turn around and say, do you have a vocals up mix? And you just bring the hard drive up over and he brings in the vocals up mix and goes from there. Great. So Claire and Joe, can you then talk about your perspective on, on that process of going back and forth and listening to different mixes before you kind of final set, finally settled in on, on a version that you thought was good? Um, I think it was just sort of we kind of were expecting like we Brad would send, Brad sent us that first rough mix and we're like oh yeah because I think I think the the baritone was really like prominent in the first mix in that rough mix and then um, I think that was like one part of it where we were trying in the following mixes we're like we sound awesome except I, we just heard that baritone after that first rough mix we just kept hearing that baritone wanting the baritone to really come out. Um, uh, in that first part, so and it was kind of just an interesting. We'd never gone through that process before, because like Brad, Brad's doing all the work, and then we get the product, and we're just like we, um, trying to make as many notes and like really pay attention so that to um, all the pieces and make sure everything's sounding the way we want it to, and learning how to articulate exactly what we we were looking for was was a new new process for us. But, Great. Yeah. Yeah, so then finally you uh, went through the process. It, it, you, 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 you went through mastering you, for the whole album, and it's there. Uh, Claire, can, Claire and Joe, can you tell us a little bit, tell us about the first time you heard the final mix, uh, and, and what were your thoughts about that, uh, thinking about, about the, whole, the, whole, the whole song, etc.? Um. I think the first time we heard the final mix was at my house. Is that right? I think so, yeah. We're at my house, and it was just—it was kind of an awesome experience because we've never had 
like an album like this before. So we're just we were just sort of in my kitchen and with the best speakers that we had, just sort of um, I don't know. We were just really excited. I don't know that we had a whole lot of. Um, yeah, I mean, we listened to so many different uh, mixes at that point. Yeah. That um, I think we're very happy with. Wait. Yeah, we we didn't have any like I, we I think we were careful not to have anything that we were like oh I wish we'd done it this way I think we did everything that we were gonna have that feeling about so it it felt good to just listen to the whole thing and have it be exactly how we wanted it to be. So so does the song now feel done to you or is it something now as you still go on tour and play it live that uh, it has a life and it changes or is it or is it for you that you know kind of going through that process of the studio and coming to this this kind of definitive version that's released that the rest of the world hears first. Um, you know, could you talk a little bit about that? Um, I think for the for now we we pretty much perform it as you hear it on the recording and but um, I mean there are some times where the vocal line does something a little bit different live but um, for the most part we we play it pretty much the same. I'm not I, I don't know that we'll always play it the same but um, for now it's sort of solidified. And it's and it's different in some cases because you might be touring, uh, you might be playing it solo or as a duo with Joe or maybe with a trio. But um, have you ever played it live with the exact same instrumentation that's on the record? No, we've not. That is a goal. Okay. So so did that change? Does you know? But does the absence of a musician or two uh, when you're out performing it live change the song at all for you or? Uh, is it still the same exp creative expression and, and and realization of your song? Um, do you mean like to me or to yeah to you? Um, I I think it changes when I when we're playing it. It definitely feels different than when we're like listening to the recording of it. Um, but it's it's I mean I think the the core is still there, but it's it is like a slightly different like the. How how I think of the live performance, I don't think of, I don't think of it as trying to replicate the recording exactly, um, but uh, but the court, but the what we're playing remains the same. Great. So um, at at this point, uh, Brad, is there anything else that you would like to add um, to the the story of the production process from your perspective, and then I'll let uh, Claire and Joe have the last word. Yeah, I I just follow up on two things. One, this sort of process where we were sending mixes back and forth, um, that's kind of a 21st century way of mixing. Um, the, I think it would be much easier, and we would have all preferred it if we could have all been in the same room while the mix was happening. Um, uh, some some engineers don't like to do it that way, but um, I, it's a good way to get the input right away, so you can really decide, oh, you know, the baritone guitar part is a huge priority for them. They want to hear a lot of that. So let's just do that right now. Um, and, but just circumstances, it was like, you know, I was mixing the record six hours away or sometimes on the road, and, you know, so we couldn't be in the same place at the same time. And then the other note, just on, you know, trying to perform some of these things live, uh, because so much got sort of put together around a song like this, and certainly, actually, I think even more so with some of the other songs on this record, um, it's not impossible to do them live, but it becomes a very big production. Like, to do this song live would be Clara, Joe, Elizabeth, Liz Lawrence playing two different instruments at once. So you need two Liz Lawrences. Uh, you need two Joe O'Neills, and one of those Joe O'Neills has to bring four timpani, and you need three <laughs> Claras to sing the background vocal parts. So it's it's actually impossible to recreate the exact same thing, but you do see people, uh, you know, get together and play Sgt. Pepper's, you know, where they get an orchestra and they have a bunch of different people playing those kind of different parts. Not to even 
get close to thinking we're working on something like Sgt. Pepper's, but um, it, it would be a big challenge, but it could be very cool someday if we had all those resources to get a percussionist come play the timpani parts while Joe's playing the drum part and get a couple other background vocalists to sing the part with them. But it does become a big production. You know, that, that ain't cheap, and it, it's hard to find a place where you can do those things. And Claire and Joe, the, any last uh, reflections on the process uh, that you'd like to share? Um, I think the big, th the probably the biggest thing for us is working with Brad was sort of like having a producer the way that Brad was producing um, to the, like to the extent on this album was a new experience, and it was really cool just to have somebody else, else's input on the music, and um, with Brad brought his own ideas and. We, I think almost every song like really transformed with Brad's input, so it was kind of cool to just have somebody take it to the next level. And that's like, and like we give f feedback, but it's nice to have like somebody else put like finishing touches on it because you can't, oh, you like, you don't always have the best perspective on your own how to make your own song um, sound finalized, I guess. So that was a cool, cool experience. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Clara and, and Joe and Brad, for uh, taking the time out this morning to walk us through the creative process behind the creation, the performance, the recording, and finally release of, of Air Traffic. Um, I thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good one. See you, see you soon online at Play With Your Music. Bye. Bye. Bye.